let's get started. Um, Hello everyone, I'm Jing Chen, I'm a CS professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, and today I'm happy to join with my student Yi Hua here and uh, Zhou from uh, Mooncake Labs to share with you what we believe is the key to unlock the future of ARM applications. And this is based on uh, the, a decade long research in building large scale AI systems. First of all, generally, um, ARMs have two challenges. First of all, uh, ARM training. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on this, and uh, only a small number of companies are really into training new ARM models. But in contrast, millions of applications are using ARMs to run ARM inference. Okay? Um, uh, Microsoft, for example, estimate that uh, there will be 750 million applications running ARM inference in the next year. And many industry leaders believe that every single application or service will be running ARM very soon. So that's why our primary goal in this uh, line of uh, research and development is to create a better ser service for ARM inference, in particular, long context ARM inference. Now, why long context? First of all, uh, long context presents the, the, the biggest opportunities uh, in the next few years. Um, for example, uh, there have been a lot of talking about long context and even infinite context windows these days. Um, with long context, for example, you can uh, feed hundreds of books to your LLM and immediately start asking it detailed questions about these books. With long context ARM inference, you can also dump um, a big code repository into your ARM and immediately start asking it to create new test cases uh, or even uh, add new features to the code base. With long context ARM inference, you can also upload hours of videos from your smartphone to your ARM and asking it to summarize uh, memorable moments from this video. Now, the list of exciting applications enabled by long context ARM inference goes on and on. So, so that's why uh, long context inference capability is believed to be the key by many people as the key enabler for the next wave of ARM innovations and applications. But there's always a but. Long context inference also presents the, the biggest challenges in terms of the, uh, the delay to serve this context, in terms of the, re the amount of resource you need to process this context, and also the quality will suffer, because if you let the model only read the, the context once, the model may not be able to create, uh, to find all the useful information in it. Okay. So here, I use the, uh, the two figures to show you the, the increase of delay and also the increase of amount of resources you need to process long context. With longer context, the model needs longer time to process the context, and also the amount of resource you need to process the long context grow super linearly with the, with the length of context. And this is true even with all these sparsity-based optimizations. Okay? So just to give you a context, uh, just to give you some perspective, um, a large code repository, uh, the length of the large re code repository will be uh, something like a Kubernetes code base, will be 2 million tokens. Um, a long book, a 200 page book, will be about 250K tokens. And, about a, and, and a one hour video will contain at least 360,000 uh, tokens. And all these token numbers are way towards the right of these figures. Okay, so clearly there's a big problem. Now, to unleash the potential of long context inference, what we need is a better system. A better system that can serve long context inference with lower delay and lower cost and at very high quality as well. Okay? And we believe we have a, a answer to that, and that's driven by our decade long research in large scale AI systems, uh, building large scale AI systems. The key insight here is you need a better abstraction for the long context data. Traditionally, long context data will be used as part of the input, so-called in-context learning. The, the context will be uh, viewed as part of the input tokens. Now, that's why the model needs a lot of time to process it. Now, that's very slow. And the, on the other hand, so-called fine-tuning models, error and fine-tuning, embeds those new contacts or new knowledge in the model's weights. But it takes a lot of time 
to, to fine tune the models in the first place. And these fine tunings usually takes hours to tens of hours to even several days, and sometimes you don't get it right the first, the first time. Our insight is that the abstraction for long context data should not be the tokens or should, should not be the model weights. It should be the KV cache. So what is KV cache? KV cache is the internal understanding of the, long context, of the large language model on the long context data. Okay? So you feed the long context data to the model once, and the model can create an internal understanding, which is the KV cache. So that's why if you, if you use KV cache, uh, as a representation of the long context, the model can use it and understand it directly. And, uh, that's the high-level reason why we focused on long context, when we, why we focused on KV cache as the abstraction for long context service. And LM cache uh, is basically this, uh, this open source project we have that's inspired by this new abstraction called KV cache. And uh, it's, a, it's a highly optimized implementation for managing and serving long context data in the form of KV caches. Because, long con because KV cache already captures the model's internal understanding of the long context data, um, serving the long context inference with KV cache can massively speed up the inference, and also it avoids a lot of repeated computation because the, if the context is used again and again and uh, looked at by the model itself. And also, because you can, can change the content in the KV cache, you have a good chance to improve the quality, uh, which is not covered in this slide. And all these benefits, can happen without changing the model and the context, okay, or, or, the, or the prompt. So it's totally transparent to the applications running on top of it. Now, enough, enough talking about the abstraction ideas of our AV, uh, ARM cache. So let's just look at, quickly look at the, the, the speed up. Right? So compared to VRM, VRM probably a lot of you guys have heard about, it's a widely used open source project in industry for its superior performance over alternatives such as TGI or Olama. But compared to VRM, uh, ARM cache can still reduce the response delay, the so-called to time to first token by 10x in popular applications such as multi-run QA, uh, retrieval ag augmented generation, or rack. Okay. Now, uh, again, I want to emphasize that ARM cache is a, a system on top of existing uh, serving engines. So uh, it's actually built on top of VRM. So if you use VRM, you can uh, use ARM cache uh, directly. And uh, not just serving in, uh, ARM inference faster, it can also reduce the cost compared to, I mean, if, if we want to achieve the same uh, serving throughput on the same model, um, we, here we compare to uh, our serving cost with AWS, uh, AWS on-demand service, or any scale of these popular services. The cost will, can, can be five to 10x cheaper depending on the, work, the characteristics of the workload. So before I hand over to the student and uh, collaborators to show you the demos, I want to quickly go over the architecture of this system. There is a request router at the top that handles all the requests and, and map that to uh, serving pods. And each serving pod runs a state-of-art VRM serving system. Uh, we collaborate with VRM so that uh, this, the serving pods can run the latest VRM version. And Behind each VRM, there's a front-end server of ARM cache that handles the interaction with VRM and also maps the KV cache back to the backend. And the backend will be an efficient storage system of KV cache on top of heterogeneous storage hardware. Um, so a, a very quick walk, walkthrough of the, uh, of the process of storing KV cache looks like this. A request comes in, the router maps that to one of the serving pods. The serving pods runs VRM to create a KV cache. Now, this is the first time you, you see this context, you have to run the inference once. But when the, the, the VRM creates the KV cache internally, the, KB, uh, the VR, VRM will tell our backend, but sorry, our front end, uh, here is a KV cache, a new KV cache. The first, first time I see a new context, where to store the KV cache. And the front end will ask a KV cache manager uh, to decide which backend server or where, uh, which backend servers uh, to store the KV cache. In this case, it can be distributed uh, stored in different, in different locations. 
So that's storing KB cache. What about retrieving KB cache? Now, if the next time a request with a very I mean, similar uh, context coming in again, uh, the VRM will ask our front end server, have you seen this context? Have you seen, uh, do, do we have a KB cache of this context in the first place? Uh, the front end server will ask uh, the KB cache manager to get the location of the stored KB cache, and they can be merged together. So this all sounds quite familiar with you, uh, if you if you know a, bit, a little bit about KB cache related research. But what's new here is that the KB cache is not stored as uh, its original big tensor format. We speed it up by compressing KB cache into bit string so that KB cache can be flow easily and quickly across different nodes, across different parts. And more, uh, more than just uh, compressing KV cache, we also allow KV cache to be composed dynamically uh, in a way that if you have input with multiple contacts in it at the same time, the KV cache, I mean, let's say if you have seen this, uh, these contacts documents separately before, you can combine the KV cache uh, in a dynamic way so that you don't have to, to reread the whole documents over and over again. Okay, so these are our two, uh, I mean, I, I just highlight these two optimizations. There are a lot of engineering optimizations behind the ARM cache system, uh, but, but I think I've talked, I highlight two, uh, highlight two optimizations, and there are many more. Uh, feel free to check out the, the code repository. And now I'm handing the stage to Ihua to uh, give you guys a, a quick um, demo of the whole thing, the real thing. Cool. Let me try to. I think I need to maybe stop. Uh, oh, I see. Cool. Okay, cool. So yeah. Uh, so what we what we have here what we have here is uh, we are uh, we are having some Lambda servers running with uh, a six thousand and deploying some VOM and VOM with M cache. Uh, so basically, what we, what we are currently doing is we have a. a M cache with VLM deployed on a Kubernetes uh, environment. So if you do this kubectl uh, get pods, you will see the here is a M cache VLM deployment, and also as here as well, if we if we do the kubectl get pods, uh, we are we are seeing there is a standard VLM <coughs> deployed here. And <clears throat> based on this deployment, based on the serving engine deployment, uh, we are running some uh, very simple rag application. Uh, on the front end, so let me open up the, this one. So on the left hand side here is uh, VLM engine plus uh, M cache with KV blending feature, and on the right hand side there is a center VLM engine. And what we're running here is basically there is a very simple rag application which is configured to retrieve five trunks, and in the total there is 25k, uh, 25,000 tokens. So this is a uh, long context uh, example of a long context, although it's not that long. Uh, and the documents, the database is more, it's, uh, it's about a, it contains a list of documents uh, and man pages about a command line tool called FMPack. And right now, let, let me go to ask it a, a few questions. And so, for example, we can ask, like, what's FMPack? Uh, uh, so, describe what, ooh, okay, what? Well, FFM? MPEG in 10 words. Let me copy it to here. And okay, let's let's feel the, the speed. Okay, on the left hand side, so the M cache is uh, generating the answer with just uh, time to first token of 1.71 seconds. And on the right hand side, the original VM, it takes uh, 5.40 seconds to prefill, to process this uh, 25K long context and ge generate the results. And let me maybe just uh, ask another question. So say, for example, uh, how, how to specify input, uh, how to specify input file using FFmpeg? Pasting here. Okay, it's running. Like you can see, the uh, the left hand side it almost immediately start start generating the response. But on the right hand side, the VLM, the original VLM, st still need a couple of times. Uh, so, so, uh, need some time to preprocess the, uh, the the retrieved chunks. So to conclude, like M cache not only like uh, can not only uh, 
reduce the time to first token, reduce this response delay. Also, it saves the GPU cycles when pre-processing those long contexts. And yeah, that's a basically a quick demo of the M cache. And let me hand the flow to, to Joe here. Okay, cool. Uh, cool. Okay, cool, yeah. Um, thanks for all the work. Uh, thanks for all the great demo. And uh, let's actually see, like, we talked about a lot of, about the drags already, but let's actually feel a drag in production. I guess, like, many of you probably already, like, seen drags, but, like, let's feel an actual drag in production. So this is a drag. Uh, oh. Is it playing? Okay, yeah, uh, so uh, this is like a chat app we took from one of the, like, the great uh, Postgres companies. And then we asked a question like how to do analytics in Postgres. We didn't slow it down at all. But you can see like there's like a heartbreaking like 20 second wait until like it actually starts generating questions, uh, like the answer. The actual answer to generating is pretty good. Like we know the companies we work with, like the React uh, application builders, make it like try different retrieval techniques or improve the quality. But like there's hitting a wall. Like there's no way to get the time to first, first token down. And I'm myself a database person. So the first thing like we try is always in this kind of application is like, okay, so let's make database better. So we actually spend time to build like a state-of-the-art vector database. And then when we start handing them into the, the application developer's hands, we start to realize it actually don't matter at all. Like when looking at the whole like time uh, span across the uh, rag application, the retrieval comparing to like the re-ranking and generation using LRM, it does not matter at all. So we're not actually optimizing anything here. Then we we'll start looking at, okay, what's the actual solution? Well, that's when I uh, found the RM cache project. I think, okay, uh, maybe it's not a data problem at all. So RM cache will actually shrink the time to first token by shrink the pre-filling time of RMs. Great. That's the actual solution. Well, but wait a second. Uh, I soon start to learn, like, each LM cache is actually on the magnitude of like hundreds of megabytes or two gigabytes. So we are actually still having another data problem and the actual bigger data problem since like the, what we store are actually bigger. We need to manage the KV cache. Cool. So let's actually try to rebuild a better rag or better general application. Uh, hof hopefully, most of you should be familiar with like this the classic rack. If you're not, like, just please read it. So, uh, the classic rack works by you have documents and you have data. You store them in into like a vector database, uh, embedding them, and then at, uh, at query time, people will query the vector database to retrieve the relevant information, and then like you will throw the con context and prompts as like natural language into like LRM, and then the LRM is, will be generating the response. Okay, let's see like how can we uh, actually utilize LRM cache and then put that into this whole diagram. The hope is like uh, apps will be able to manage the KV cache just as it's like managing all the vectors, all the embeddings in the vector database. So instead of just storing the data in vector database, we'll start to pre-process them so we can like generate a lot of like for the probably the more useful longer contacts, pre-process them with like LRM, and then generate and store those states in LRM cache. So in query time, like we, we don't if you find something's already in the LRM cache, you no longer need to feel, feed the whole like uh, contacts and prompt in nature language. You directly serve the cache content, which will be much faster. But while do you actually expect the application builder to actually manage, in addition to managing a vector database, also start to manage a KV cache? What, what if we can provide an end-to-end -end solution? 
So this is like what Mooncake is trying to do. It's, uh, we are trying to build a modern data lake. I guess for people like don't uh, in the data community, essentially data lake is like you have object store. People start to throw like all kinds of different like arbitrary data into it, and then build things on top of that to like get va value from it. So what would that look like in this scenario? So people would just like store data as like a data lake tables. Uh, those are just uh, stored on object stores. And then on top of that, instead of like, just moving data into a vector database and index them, we directly build some vector indexes on the uh, object store directly. And then in addition, things like the data lake already have a lot of the background processes to do optimizations, to do compaction. It's very nature to also add something to just pre-process the documents and then to generate those LRM states. And the LRM state can also be just stored in the object store. Uh, although they're pretty big, but like storing an object store is cheap enough. And then for like the user application at query time, you just query the whole data lake and do the retrieval and it will automatically like either retrieve the context or retrieve the actual LRM cache and serve the in the optimal format to LRM to make it faster. Yeah, this is essentially I see what we saw like the React evolution over what's well, kind of hard to believe it's already two years. So at the start, everyone's having like in-memory vector databases. Um, it's pretty fast, especially the vector search itself. It's like extremely fast. But the cost at scale was like crazy. People would spend like 10 times or 100 times their, what they spend on regular databases than they spend on like in-memory vector databases. Then people start to like, when they have like bigger workloads or they realize like retrieval does, does not matter as much, they start to use like object store based vector databases. That's like LensDB or proto, proto buffer. So, the cost was much, much better. Things like you no longer pay the in-memory. It's like stateless, everything stores on object store. But the performance, like even the retrieval part, is getting slower. And then now we see, like, let's, what if we actually put like, vector DB and LRM cache both in object store? The cost was still great. You store a little more uh, documents, but it's on object store. So cost is not the highest priority. And then the performance is actually better, and even better than the previous in-memory implementations. Okay, let's actually try to fill it in uh, a video demo. So we are extending the Kiwi cache to actually like we we store the Kiwi cache inside object stores, and then on the other side, like it's just feeding from local uh, in-memory databases. Let's see the performance. So you can see that like, we can serve from object store even faster than serving from local in-memory state by storing the LM cache together with your data. Cool. So let me just uh, quickly summarize. Um, First of all, uh, Elm Cache, this project uh, in collaboration with Mooncake Lab, uh, we strive to make this thing uh, as, as uh, easy to, to use and deploy as possible for our users, uh, including container images, including library-based uh, deployment, and also on cloud. And uh, um, this project is not, I mean, doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, we collaborate with uh, both open source communities and also industry de uh, design partners, um, and we, closely work with open source communities to leverage their latest serving engines to improve our basic serving performance and also to be able to run different models on different hardware. Okay, so that's the power of open source community. And as we get more industry adopters, uh, we're always looking for more use cases from you guys. If you, if you feel like you want to contribute or you, you have uh, a good use case for long context LRM serving, uh, please reach out to us, okay? Or, or scan the, uh, the QR code down there. So just want to quickly summarize the, the whole thing. First of all, like I said, LRM inference, in particular long context inference, is going to be very important, uh, present the biggest opportunity, but also it creates the biggest system challenges. And to 
unleash the potential of long context inference, we need an efficient system. And in our belief, the best system to serve long context inference will be the system that can manage KB cache efficiently. Okay? That's the key to the success. And ARM cache is this one instance. Uh, we built this to combine by combining latest VRM uh, serving engine and the latest KB cache research uh, and technologies. And Mooncake uh, Labs um, uh, create this, uh, this, this enabler for us to make this trade off. So what is trade off here? The trade off is you need to store a lot of KB cache in, um, um, in, in big data format. And those KB cache uh, doesn't have to, to, to exist in your CPU memory or local disk. It can store on S3. And Mooncake Lab enables that. I think that, that creates the whole ecosystem of KB, I mean, creates the, the sort of uh, the, the initial version of the whole ecosystem for KB cache optimization. That's the, that's the vision. Okay, so thanks for, uh, for tuning in, and uh, we're happy to take any questions now. Hi, uh, great presentation. Um, quick question. Uh, can you not use an object store in cluster, like for example, Min IO or or a Redis uh, blob store? Oh, good, good, good question. Yeah, absolutely. Like there's many ways to store these KV caches, but so you can store it locally, or even just store it in memory, or uh, even in GPU memory. But like uh, we, uh, but they are very large. So in order to like efficiently like. Uh, store them, you want to store, store it on something like chipping enough and ideally like more cloud native. You want to like actually separate, separate the storage and the compute so you can like serve it on any compute in instance without need to like worry about if, but do you actually have the cache locally? Thanks. Hello. Um, I have a question in terms of the infrastructure you put. So you have the ARM cache to catch your Victor database, is am I understand correctly? Uh, so yes, yeah, so you have to store KV cache somewhere, and database will be the natural choice to store them. Yes, yes. To, to index them. So if I catch the slide correctly, you store the pre-processed LLM state on the LLM cache. So what exactly is the pre-processed LLM state? The pre oh so 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 I asking how to get I mean, how to um, how to LLM create the fear, uh, the KV cache in the first place? Is that a question? No. Um, uh. So you get uh, pre so in the diagram you mm. put a pre-processed LLM state no, on the that's, that's to store in the LLM cache. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what sees the pre-processed LLM cache is. Yeah, oh, pre-processed oh, yeah. LLM uh, state. Yeah. Uh, so initially you just store like storing data into these like tables, and then you need to somehow like generate the LLM states. Then later you can just serve them. So this is the the pre-process. -pro Essentially, in the background, you want to start like use LRM, is ask it like what would be the LRM, what what would be your state, if I preview with this document, and then you save them. Then later, when you actually need to use it, you can directly use the pre-processed LRM state. Thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier around if you've already processed some documents, you got them in there, you can add new documents without pre-processing the old documents again. Um, but how do you handle things like if you want to handle multiple versions of a document that have, like, for example, the Kubernetes documents for version 1.2 and 1.3, like just having different versions of a similar document? And in addition, how do you subtract documents back out of there? Are they stored as separate kind of bodies in there so you can say remove that document? Um, I'm so glad you asked that because uh, so basically um, the KB cache is a function of the text and also the model, right? So you ask about what if the text changes slightly incrementally, right? Um, if you change the text incrementally, the part of the text that's not changed by that that, that, that incremental change uh, can still hold the KB cache. Now again, but the next time you use the KB cache, you have to to update its attention matrix slightly. Um, now you don't have to 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 change the attention matrix. Uh, completely because only um, so our, our key observation in this line of research is um, not every pair of tokens have important attentions between them. Okay, so if you change things incrementally, uh, the the KB cache of those change tokens will definitely be changed. 
But the remaining tokens don't have to be changed a lot uh, at all because only a few tokens need to be updated. So that's the idea. Um, so just slightly extend your question a, a little bit. Like I said, KV Cache is, depends on both text and the model. The model can change as well, right? Maybe you fine tune the model. What if the KV Cache, I mean, uh, what about the KV Cache? Can it be still reused with, uh, I mean, by the new model? That can also be reused. That's just part of things that the ARM Cache can support as well. Uh, but again, if the, the, the model is completely changed, that all the architecture has changed as well, then the KV cache shape will be different. So that's the different story then. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, great talk. I had a question about like, um, VLLM has this uh, prefix caching. So is that, does that use something like this under the hood or uh, what is the difference? So uh, short answer to you is VRM itself only store KV cache in, in GPU memory. It does use CPU memory for offloading, but it doesn't hold CPU, uh, across in, in sort of reuse KV cache across inference uh, using CPU memory. Um, so early on, we, we collaborated with VRM team closely on this because they also realized that KV cache uh, is something you want to hold for a long time, so you definitely need a backend system to store KV cache not in GPU memory, not just in CPU memory, but also distributed across multiple nodes. So that needs a separate system, and ARM, and ARM cache basically was the open source project to support that. Sounds good, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, one more question I had, mm -hmm. like uh, in this RAG setup, you would have a lot of documents that you would create a LLM uh, cache for. So when you retrieve it, I'm assuming you have some sort of indexing to retrieve only specific cache for that. Uh, prefix in some way. So how does that work? Do you store them? Uh, how do you store them in S3 bucket and how do you uh, So um, I, 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 is, is the question how to look up the KV cache store to find yeah, the KV cache of the right? Get uh -huh. specific uh, portions of the KV cache from yeah, like, uh, essentially, like KV Cache, like you kind of store it like next, like similar to your store your documents. It's essentially like previously you use vector search to retrieve a document. Now you use the vector search to retrieve the corresponding key, like LM Cache entry. So it's kind of the indexing and retrieval part is kind of similar. Okay, very similar to VectorDB, but instead of yeah, yeah, but everything is on object cache. store. Sounds cool. Thank you. Hi, uh, how does this work for structured data like uh, Delta Lake or Iceberg? Can Sorry, you well, use this for structured data? Structured data. Data, like, can yeah, like we uh, interrupt documents, can I use it against uh, some historical data that we have? Depending on like, what's your use case for like uh, feeding into the uh, large language model and then to generation. Like for example, you, if you actually throw in the, all the tables as or like the contest itself into RLM, then definitely. But if you actually, like for example, you run a query first and then throw it into RLM, then probably you do directly build your traditional rag against your database. Right, well what would you recommend? You would recommend LLM to generate a query and then query the database, or would you feed the structured data? Oh yeah, I guess it totally depends on your use case. Uh, if you like, if the use case is actually like, for example, BI, you actually want like insights to you. If you actually want to run SQL, then like run SQL against the traditional database is probably better. But if you're like questioning a more like ambiguous or more like uh, you want to ask some like more human uh, like, like questions, then just directly feeding everything to our might be a good choice. Yeah, a hypothetical scenario: a stock price chart you have and then you want to block a chart, but a user wants to talk in a natural language and be able to generate that against some historical data that we download from external sources. Yeah, so like if it's plot, plot it's usually better to like have, have our, or like there are several ways. One is like you can provide the API for function calling to the RM. Then this will probably do the best job, and the next best will be like how RLMs generate a SQL. Hey, uh, last question. I think I had a quick question. Um, great presentation, by the way. I love the demo. Um, so the, uh, the the cache that you have, right? Like I was I, I was concerned about like what is the hit rate of the cache? Like how often does do you have these this repetition uh, for a context? Uh, how often the, do you update the KV cache for the context? Right. Or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or how often do you when you when you have uh, when you look up the vectors to f to retrieve your cache? Like, what do you think is um, uh, like is the repetition like how how often does your cache get a hit rather than uh, having to compute it all over again like what's the hit rate that's a good question so um 
It, it really depends on the, the, the application right. uh, that issues the query in the first place. Chat applications will have pr pretty frequent uh, reuse of KV cache, although the KV cache will be about, um, I mean, it's chat history is not going to be very, very long context. But of course, if you have very long conversations, the context can grow in, indefinitely. Um, for RAG services, uh, it, it also depends on whether there are hot items in the, in the database or not, right? So if you have content, I mean, context that, I'm oh, sorry, RAG, Sorry, uh, chunks in the database that's queried, but that's being used as context for many queries. Right. Those chunks will be uh, will, 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 will be uh, hit very frequently, much more frequently than others. So, if you talk about uh, exact time duration between two hits of the same chunks, uh, our I mean, so we run some analysis uh, for our own research papers. So, 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 so we use uh, traces from Moonshot AI from uh, Microsoft and 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 also. Um, I forgot the, the other company, but uh, they, they're open source traces. They don't necessarily represent real um, the, the the most representative workload in real world. But uh, the, the the impression I got was uh, about um, tens of seconds to s several minutes. That that's sort of uh, the medium. Now, of course, there are, are situations you reuse the KV cache just within a several seconds to hours. Um, what I want to emphasize is. Uh, traditionally, people think about KV cache to be reu I mean, to be stored in, in GPU. Uh, that only applies when the when the reuse ha uh, I mean, happens within several seconds, which is not a common case in real world. So, so that's why you definitely need an extension of the KV cache storage, like ARM cache. Got it for right. longer durations of retention. Yes, Makes exactly. Sense. exactly. Yeah, thanks. So, I think we're we're running out of time. Uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um,